join me in prayer. Lord of all wisdom, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we think on these things, open our hearts and our minds to hear you. Amen. Please be seated. As many of you know, I spent some of January away in Israel and Palestine. It was truly an incredible experience of learning, of spiritual growth, of fellowship, and of intense and difficult conversations. The focus of the class that I was taking was hope in the midst of conflict. And we touched on themes of reconciliation by listening to different experiences and narratives of people all over the country. We met with many soldiers. We met with refugees. We met with Jewish, Christian, and Muslim religious leaders. We met with families, stayed in people's homes. We met children and youth, pilgrims, and many, many others. And we ate incredible food. While there, we ran into Jesus. The Jewish man who lived in first century Palestine under Roman occupation. We learned many things about his life and the sociopolitical context in which he lived. And even about the geography and how the topography affected and shaped the culture. For example, a memorable lesson was how much of Jesus's ministry happened in communities along highways the highways of the day, Capernaum, which is the village of Peter where Jesus spent a lot of his time, uh, was along one portion of a major road. And the Sermon of the Mount, part of which we read today, takes place up the hill from the village, a place where lots of people could have seen and heard Jesus as they went along their way. We visited many churches, marked Jesus's life, Bethlehem, where he was born, Nazareth, where he grew up, the Jordan River, where he was baptized, and in Jerusalem, where he was tried, executed, and resurrected. One of my favorite places is the Basilica of the Beatitudes. It's this beautiful building on the hilltop, um, marking the site where we believe Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, which we are reading. It's this beautiful building that it's not very big, but it's marked by water. When you come inside, there's, there's uh, not real water, but water marking in the, in the tile on the floor leading to the altar. And you see water flowing in the tiles from the altar because water blessings are like water. They cover all. And they flow from the people towards the altar and from the altar towards the people. That's what blessings are like. And on the top of the building, you see this beautiful gold dome. And you see fish swirling around the blue marking of water. There's a picture of this on the Facebook group. Um, I invite you to, to look at it. It's beautiful. Another favorite was Dominus Flevit Church. And this is a small church on the Mount of Olives. It sits directly across from the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock. And this church commemorates an event that perhaps many of us don't, don't really know. Um, it's a moment where as Jesus is coming down from the Mount of Olives, right after this wonderful procession, Hosanna, here comes the King who will save us right after. He comes down from the mountain and sees the city right in front of him, and he weeps. He weeps for Jerusalem as he knows the destruction of the city and the temple. When you look at the altar in this church, and there's a picture I posted on, on the Facebook group, you see not stained glass as we normally see behind altars. It's clear, clear glass. And directly in front of you is the city. And you sit there, looking at this altar, hearing Jesus' words, Jerusalem, I tried to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks, and you didn't want to come. 
right? And you think about those words and you, and you weep. You weep for the city that you see in front of you, a city marred by pain and struggle and division. And you also weep for the city here, for Detroit, for Royal Oak, the way that Jesus weeps, knowing the pain and the struggle of the people here. However, the main purpose of our group's experience in Israel and Palestine not, was not really to search for the first century Jesus. We were looking for Jesus today as he walks among the people who live there, the Israelis and Palestinians, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Druze, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, secular and non-religious, and the many others who live in this part of the world roughly the size of the state of New Jersey. This is a place marked by incredible natural and cultural beauty, as well as intense security and scrutiny. There are cameras everywhere and they track your movement. In fact, you enter the country by scanning your face. You leave the country by scanning your face, right? Everything is monitored wherever you go. In this place, where landscapes of olive trees and rolling hills are carved by fences, watchtowers, and even minefields, coastlines of beautiful turquoise water in the Mediterranean are enjoyed by the wealthy and blocked from the poor. Otherworldly desert landscapes, it really feels like being on Mars, to which more and more people are pushed out into there without freedom of movement and under constant threat of violence due to their nationality or their language. And let me tell you, we found Jesus in 2023. In the stories and the lives of people who are struggling, scared, angry, resisting, forging a path forward, loving and peace building. I met a woman who through her craft shop in the old Nazareth market, brings together people of different faiths for common understanding of their humanity through art. I met a community leader who has been fighting orders from the state to leave his home so it can be destroyed and the land given to settlers. And yet, he dedicates his time to lead an after school program for children and youth so that they can be safe despite the constant threats of violence. I met young people who are third generation refugees. They are refugees, their parents are refugees, their grandparents were refugees. And they've never met, they've never known a stable home because the state has enclosed their areas with watchtowers and patrols. They too make art as a channel for telling their story, as a witness that they are still here forging on for a future, even if the future looks bleak. I met several community leaders who are dedicating their lives to work with veterans of wars, bringing attention to their pain and the trauma, not so that they can promote nationalism and so they can promote revenge on the enemies, but so they can use these stories of pain and struggle in order to advocate for peace. My friends, I saw Jesus in many places in this holy and sacred land in the lives of people living true discipleship, being salt of the earth, being a light to their people and to the nations, living into the righteousness that can be found in the kingdom of heaven. Today's gospel passage is part of this long sermon that Jesus gave toward the beginning of his ministry, up on that beautiful hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It truly is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And so in this debut sermon that Jesus gives, he tells a huge crowd gathered what it meant to be a disciple of a different kind of kingdom different from what the, what the one that they knew. A kingdom not of occupation and repression, but a kingdom of love and righteousness. Last week, we heard the intro to the sermon 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Today we hear Jesus challenging the crowd into discipleship. You are the salt of the earth. You can't lose your taste. That's a waste. You are the light of the world. You can't be hidden under a bushel basket. Be an example of good works. In his sermon, Jesus is teaching the people about ways of being that match, they're congruent with the kingdom of heaven and with righteousness. As he does that, he reminds them that the law and the commandments that they've already learned, they're good. But you have to actually live them out, practice them, not just talk about them. Even then, Jesus knew there was a human tendency to talk about the right thing to do. Even our own predilection for monitoring other people's lives and their behavior, judging whether they're doing right or wrong. Even uh, sometimes our own behavior can be questionable. So he pointed out that there were, whoops, Siri's tracking my sermon. Um, he, Jesus pointed out that at the time there were religious leaders were very good at telling other people what practices they were getting right and which ones they were getting wrong. But they themselves were not fulfilling the spirit of the law, God's purpose. And so we hear that in the Isaiah reading. Look, you serve your own interests on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? So then Isaiah turns it around, emphasizing the real purpose of the commandments. Is not this the fast that I choose, to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Beloved of God, there was a man who said amazing things and did wonderful things 2,000 years ago in a holy and sacred land. His words and examples have changed our world. And they continue to change the world because disciples choose to be salt and light in a world of division. A world of I am right and you are wrong. A land of this is mine and you must leave. In these places, Jesus is walking right now. In our communities, in the midst of our neighbors, Jesus is walking through you. I wonder, what kind of taste do our neighbors get from interactions with us? What kind of light do the people see when they look at us through our examples. Amen.